That's our Lou Boudreau. Head out in center field. Tucker and Kennedy come running in arm in arm. This is Cleveland's team, a baseball history podcast. A regular look back at professional baseball in Cleveland from 1901 and beyond. Now, here's your host, Guardians team historian, Jeremy Fedor. Hey, Guardians fans. We are back with another podcast this week. So in honor of the new hiring of a manager for the Guardians, uh, we are actually going to do one of the interviews I had with a former manager, though not Cleveland's manager, he actually managed for Boston. However, John Farrell did spend parts of five seasons with Cleveland, 1987 to 1990, and a little stint in 1995. So without further ado, here's our interview with John Farrell. So I can sync this, so there we go, there's my clapping noise. Um, so, just we're gonna kind of run through everything. I, I, I like just kind of picking brains and seeing where everything's at, okay. and um, so, <clears throat> Yeah, it's going back to the beginning, and a lot of the same questions I asked Scott. When did you realize baseball was really your uh, trajectory in life? Oh, this has to be uh, back when I was in grade school, entering high school. Um, My dad pitched professionally, actually, in the Indians minor league system. Uh, So growing up in the New York area, I was a big Yankee, Met fan. I I didn't have an allegiance to either one, but I I just loved uh, watching games there. Um, so I knew early on that this is something I felt like I could be successful with, even though at a very early age I had, I had the ability to throw a baseball <laughs> in an okay fashion. Um, and going through high school, uh, that became a little bit more clear uh, as I aged and developed. I got drafted by Oakland out of high school. Uh, that took me on to college and kind of things fell in place and, and had that, I would say, a normal progression for someone who ends up with the ability to pitch in the big leagues. Was Oakland, um, was that surprising or was that, you know, something you wanted to just, hey, ninth round, let's see if we can do better or just want to go to college? Well, actually, it was the last year Charlie Finley owned the athletics. So the decision was made for me because even being a ninth round pick, there was no signing bonus offered. A monthly salary and a plane ticket was the uh, was the package that they were willing to put forth. So uh, that became pretty clear. I wasn't going to take that path at the time, uh, and ended up uh, signing a letter of intent and a, and a scholarship uh, to go to Oklahoma State. And then, you know, Cleveland in '83 and '84 was looking at you pretty hard, and obviously drafted you both times. Do you know? Did you know Cleveland was after you? Was that something that was kind of a surprise or? It was a little bit of a surprise uh, the second time around uh, because after being taken, I believe, in the 13th round, in 16th. 16th round in, in 83, um, I felt like I'd, I could better my position because they, I had missed a lot of time during that my junior season at Oklahoma State. So to me, it was a pretty clear-cut decision that if, the, if it wasn't the right time to sign because of the – bonus they might have been offering, then you know what, I'll take my chances, go back, get another year closer to my degree. And it worked out, being the 32nd pick the following year. And you you mentioned your dad playing in the organization. Had you ever been to Cleveland? I mean, obviously Cleveland in the 80s was a big No, different. no. Uh, n- never really traveled much west of New Jersey. Um, so I had never been to Cleveland. Um, obviously... You know, growing up and, and being a football fan as well, you know, the, the Browns were something that drew the attention more so than maybe the Indians at the time. Um, and it just worked out where I ended up coming here. And it, drafts weren't like they were, in, you know, now like they didn't fly you out here as a, a draftee to check out, you know, municipal stadium or anything. Was it just here's your ticket to the minors and, and go? Yeah, uh, we, we actually advanced pretty far into the college playoff format. Uh, We ended up in the College World Series in 84, so the draft took place during the College World Series. So as that selection and that draft was unfolding, we were still active. So I returned to Stillwater, Oklahoma after the College World Series was over, and the the drafting scout handled the negotiations. So that's where it was uh, culminated. The contract was signed, and I reported to Waterloo, uh, Waterloo, Iowa, shortly after that. 
Was that just a phone call? Hey, you've been drafted by Cleveland? That's what it was. Um, I don't even know if at the time, you know, ESPN was just starting to televise college baseball, but I don't know that they televised the draft uh, at that point in time. Just amazing the difference, not even that long ago. Yeah, true. Um, so you do your time in the minors, and then I always like asking about your first game, the first time you come in, and do you recall your, uh, your Major League <laughs> debut? Yeah, almost like it was yesterday because I had always been a starting pitcher through college to the minor leagues, and I get called up that earlier that day that I reported here. Um, and we are here against Milwaukee at the, at the old stadium. Uh, and as we're advancing through the game, you know, that was, a, that was when pitching staffs were no more than 10 people. So we're going through the, the latter innings, and – the last guy down the bullpen is Doug Jones, and he comes in the game, I want to say, in like the middle of the eighth inning and ended up pitching, I want to say, like two and a th- two two innings. And I'm the last one down there because they said, hey, for tonight, just go to the bullpen, cover us in, in the event we need something. So we go into extra innings in, uh, against Milwaukee, and, and I can remember first time in a big league on a big league mound. I don't know that I could feel my knees. I don't know that I could really – get a sense of where I was, but I threw two pitches uh, and I had runners at first and second base with both uh, Robin Yount and Paul Molitor. And uh, somehow I found a way to get out of it without giving up a run in extra innings. And at the time, the big source for information through the game was the USA Today. They would always have a little clip on, on what teams were doing. And I can remember reading about Pat Tabler earlier that summer that he was hitting well over 500 for his career with the bases loaded. So in the bottom of the 12th or 13th, I forget which inning it was right now, but here comes Pat Tabler to the plate with the bases loaded. And I thought, you know, this game is over. And he ends up hitting a bloop signal right behind second baseman. And we walk off the Brewers that night after an inning of pitch uh, in my debut and ended up getting a win. Yeah, you, like you said, Molitor single, Yount single, then Glenn Braggs hit into a double play, uh, Felder walked, and B.J. Suroff grounded out. <laughs> Did you have time to get you know your family? Nowadays, again, comparing and contrasting, you know, everyone's family would be in the ballpark. Was your family able to make the trip to Cleveland? Mm, no, no, they, they weren't here that first day because um, I was scheduled to start the second game of a doubleheader coming up where that's what I was called up in advance to do. That's where I was scheduled. They were able to come in for that game, but not the first appearance. And did you take home any mementos from that game, or again, is it not like? Uh, I think I got the scorecard. You know, that's posted or pinned up in the in the dugout uh, from that night. So yeah. And municipal stadium, I guess, compared to you know playing in Oklahoma. How, what was your first impression of coming into that mammoth you know place? <laughs> well, that probably sums it up. That word is how mammoth and. and enormous the ballpark was uh, yeah the dimensions field it, it, that's all the same but when you look up and see uh, you know stands bleachers uh, an upper deck as vast as that place was uh, it was imposing and um, when you come on to the the big league team was there anyone and that the pitching staff that took you under their wing or became kind of a mentor or um, I had played in the minor leagues with a number of guys that were here before me. So I, I knew, you know, Andy Allenson as my catcher to Corey Snyder, uh, who was in right field at the time. Um, you know, Scotty, Scott Bales and I, we were in the minor leagues together. He was here prior to me getting here. So there, there were, there was some familiarity, which certainly helped breaking in and just getting your feet on the ground. Uh, but, uh, later on, not so much that given year, but the next year, uh, that's where you know both Tom Candiotti and Bud Black became somewhat mind mentors uh, in my first couple of years here in Cleveland. And you know, for you being just a young guy coming up, making the team, I mean, the Cleveland teams in the '80s just they they weren't what we saw eventually in the '90s with the juggernaut. But you were just happy to be uh, on the roster. I mean, we guys, Scott mentioned you guys were so young too that just kind of rolled with it. I mean, yeah, you didn't really know any different. Um, we didn't have a whole lot of success in the win-loss column, per se, but uh, we were in the major leagues. We were establishing our careers, and we were grateful for the opportunity. Uh, so while it might not have been a division-contending team year in and year out yet, it was providing opportunity to young guys to, like I say, cut their teeth and get to the big league level. And just being a baseball guy growing up, traveling to all the ballparks, was there anywhere that really, you know, whether it was Fenway or Old Yankee Stadium or, or Tigers, I mean, 
did that ever not become cool? I mean, was it just a, a neat thing to be able to pitch on those mounds? And yeah, I, I think that's if you're not only a player but a fan of the game, you 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 take some time to you know become familiar with your surroundings and every new ballpark and the nuances that they have offered and and the characteristics that were there. But as a kid growing up and watching games on TV, now all of a sudden finding yourself standing on those same mounds, uh, that was, uh, at, it could be at times a little surreal, uh, but uh, you know, experiences that you'll never relinquish. Was there anyone that you know, ended up in the, the batter's box where you just had to pinch yourself, like, wait a second, Paul Molitor's standing right there, and here I am. <laughs> oh, that was a long list because uh, you know, there, there were guys that you, you know, as a kid, like I said, in New York, I mean, whether it was Mattingly to, um, you know, I, I, I can remember just the, the Yankees in particular. That, to me, having pitched against Cleveland here in Cleveland, uh, for Cleveland against the Yankees in Cleveland, and then going to New York, that was almost like the validation of, okay, you have made it to the big league level. Um, not to take anything away from other teams, but as a kid who grew up in the New York area, that really maybe entrenched it even that much more. And then 19, or actually, I don't want to skip too far ahead, how many times have you been asked about Paul Molitor's streak and, and having a, a role in that, a la you know, Ken Keltner and DiMaggio? I mean, is that something that is a badge of honor that you still t- like talking about? It was a... Um, Poor Rick Manning, too. Cause. Yeah, right. Oh, I know. <laughs> uh, it was benefiting from a situation out of... Un- that evolved five days previous because my major league first major league start was the second game of a doubleheader. Rich Yet started the first game and he turned his ankle in that game and he was the one that was scheduled to start that night in Milwaukee. But because of the sprained ankle, he couldn't go and I got the start. Um, it was on a rainy day. There was no BP before the game. It was a matter of pull the tarp, get the pitchers ready, and the game began. And uh, with each at bat, everyone knew what was going on in the game with Molitor streak. I mean, it was I don't know, the fourth or fifth longest streak in the, in the history of the game. And after the first at bat, I, I believe there was a ground out, there was a pop up. I don't know if there was a strikeout mixed in there. Um, but yeah, you knew what was happening every time he walked to the plate. And it was almost a, uh, I don't want to say a sideshow, but it was extra attention and focus placed on his at bats, and rightfully so. But you mentioned Rick Manning, and, and for a guy that had a walk-off base hit for the home team to get booed because Molitor was left standing on deck because he drove in the winning run, uh, it, was, it was something that Archie and I have laughed about, you know, years following that. But, uh, yeah, just a really fun night. Do you recall feeling any pressure to just throw strikes to a guy? I mean, I'm sure if you walked him, the crowd wasn't going to be uh, thrilled with you. I took it as a personal challenge myself. It's like, okay, if this is... Uh, if this is what's in, in front of you, then you know what? I think that's the greatest thing about the game of baseball and, and being a pitcher is that there's a team game with still a one-on-one confrontation inside that. And you looked upon those challenges to see how you stacked up. And then um, eventually, and you seem to find your rhythm in 1989, you had seven complete games. Um, actually, go back to 1988, one of the things I was asking Scott about is you know, that's when uh, they were filming Major League and Charlie Sheen and, and Tom Berenger were at the ballpark. I don't know if you remember that day or, or the game where they had the flyover and they recorded part of it, but Scott had mentioned they had to go hide in the bullpen and they were kind of waving up. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any recollection of that? I do remember that because I remember a couple things because they also made Milwaukee County Stadium look just like Cleveland Stadium because I don't know whether it was union things that were happening at the time when they filmed the movie because a lot of the scenes were filmed in Milwaukee as well. But yeah, we, we got to know... Uh, Sheen and Behringer, they they would actually come out during BP and when the pitchers, would, we have our conditioning. They were in uniform with us just, I think, to try to build a little rapport and kind of get a sense of how the whole day works. Uh, it was kind of a neat thing to be around. But I don't know, I, I take a little personal exception to it because as, a, as an Indian at the time and playing for Cleveland, it was a little bit of a mockery. And, and you know what? Maybe there was a part of me that took a little bit of offense to the way that movie was portrayed. 
and I, I had an Scott. So no one was rushing out to wear number ninety nine, like Charlie Sheen's <laughs> no, character. No, no. And uh, you know, speaking of those numbers, what was with fifty two? Is that what they gave you, or do you have a, a reasoning you want? No, that was just what was issued to me uh, when I, my first spring training. So that's the one that stuck. Never had an inclination. What were you? What'd you wear in uh, Oklahoma? Twenty seven. And, okay, and um, Mel Hall was twenty seven uh, at that time. So, uh, yeah, I think it was one of those things. Hey, this is what's issued to you. Just take it and go. And you know, you you've been around the game long enough. How was it? You know, I look at a lot of these newspaper articles about you know the time and, and Hoinsey's writing them, and Hoinsey's still still up in the press box. You know, churning. Uh, you know, do you remember? Dealing with, with the media, was that any different for you from going from D1 to the minors to major leagues? Um, well, the, the only difference was the maybe the volume of it um, and, and you know, the, the attention that cities now played uh, or, or the, the media surrounding played versus smaller towns. But I always held a simple rule of thumb was to always give the credit and take the blame, whether that was college, minor leagues, major leagues, or as a player, or even as a coach. Um, it kind of served me well, and I, I always st stuck by that approach to dealing with the media. And one of those pictures I have in there, you're out in the community. Was that a very important thing to you when you were a player to be out and about? It was. Um, you know, I think the one thing that you start to get a sense of when you're wearing a major league uniform is how people attract to that and how people identify to it. And maybe some small gesture would have a positive impact on someone. It's not that you set out to be that way every single day, but you certainly, if you're aware enough, you see how people identify with, with their hometown team. So we made it a point, there was a number of us, I think we got a little bit more involved in the community than others, whether it's hospital visits or underprivileged situations. There was even a time of going speaking at a prison here locally. Uh, so. I think there's an inherent responsibility when you're at the major league level that you get involved and give something back to your community. And, and during your tenure, uh, Cleveland ended up taking a flyer on a, a Terry Francona. Um, do you remember <laughs> when he came to the ball club, or did you guys build a friendship, or was it kind of hard being a pitcher? And, and no, we, we struck up a friendship seemingly right away. Um, you know, a great teammate, uh, a, a guy that, you know, would always want to interact with people. He's just a very, very much a people person. And I lived in Cleveland in the off season, but I would go down to Arizona the 1st of January to get to the warmer weather and get prepared for spring training. And we trained in Tucson where Tito lived. So even in the winter months, we would work out after that 88 season. And even after he went to Milwaukee and other teams after that, we would still connect in the winter time and work out in advance of spring training. So we developed a, pretty strong relationship and friendship uh, over those following years after first playing together here in Cleveland. And I know you've been asked about it in the past, but that 88 team, I think it was, with the managers that came out of that, was is that something that you know is surprising, or did you kind of have an inclination some of these guys might have a, a future in baseball? I think the future in baseball, yes, but no one knew what that end role was going to be. Um, when you think back that there were five or six people, including Charlie Manuel, who was the hitting coach at the time, you know, we often kind of joked, was there something in the water in Cleveland that led everybody to a, you know, post-playing career that ended up in the manager's chair? Um, like I said, I think guys shared a common view of the game that they wanted to stay involved after their playing days were done. But you're so focused on what you're doing at the time, you never think, ah, sure, I'm going to manage someday. That's a little far-fetched. But it just worked out that guys, you know, were, were probably good teachers, good communicators, and, and other strengths. To me, you know, you bring up Tito. He has the greatest ability that I've ever been around of, of reading people and knowing what buttons to push and how to interact with them on a given situation. And I know that served him well and how he's cultivated his chemistry of his teams that he's been manager of. And any of the managers in your time at Cleveland, you know, take anything from them when you ended up becoming a manager? You know, I first, when I first got to AAA, Doc Edwards was my manager there. Then he became the manager here in Cleveland, and he brought me to the big leagues. So I almost looked at him as almost a second father in a way because he had a way, at least with me, to kind of put things at ease. 
when you're a young guy coming to the big leagues and here's your dream coming to life, there's a lot of, I don't know, I think there's a lot of nervousness, there's a lot of anxiety, and he had a way to quell that with me that, uh, you know, whether it's putting your arm around a guy and just kind of talking him through a situation or just your presence not being uptight, you try to learn from those examples that you were on the other side of. Now, hopefully give that same scenario to the guys you're managing at the time. And, you know, playing that, that late 80s era, do you recall, you know, anything about, you know, the rumblings of the team maybe relocating or new ballpark, stuff like that? Or is that something that not, not part of your problem, you focused on pitching? Yeah, I mean, you would hear some of that, but it, it would never... You know, it would never really affect your day-to-day. You know, you had to remain so focused on what was in front of you that you weren't worried about. Because we always used to, I personally, we would balance that with, this is a charter member of the American League, and how would Major League Baseball move a charter member? I never thought that would be the case, and I'm sure thankfully for this region, that never took place. And being a pitcher in Cleveland, you know, how often did you run into Feller when he was around? He was in spring training. Uh, every year that I was in uniform here and um, you know I think about an 18 or 19 year old guy coming to the big leagues from you know Van, Van Meter Iowa and, and having the success he did my gosh and who, who would have thought how great a pitcher he would have been had he not missed time for the service which there are many that were in that same scenario but um, yeah just a uh, a very renowned person who was very accessible to a lot of people did he ever try to tinker with anything you did, or he just let you? No, he would. He would just talk about you know what what he did. Uh, wouldn't really, you know, impose on you in any way or make suggestions. He was you know, an observer at the time, always in uniform, but uh, wouldn't cross the line out of respect to the current pitching coach or manager at the time. And um, were you actually into the history at all when you were a player, or was it something that, you know, again, it's a job then? And I don't know if I was a historian of the game. I was certainly a fan of it. I, 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 to this day, I still like watching it on TV. I think, you know, there, there's something about the game of baseball and certainly pitching that, uh, you know, you kind of glean the nuances of it. But um, I wouldn't say I'd go as far as, you know, a historian of the game. Do you recall any other players that you end up meeting, whether it was like Hall of Famers, Feather, or I don't know if Mel Harder was around when you were around? Or? Yeah, Mel Harder, Herb Score, um, who was a teammate of my dad in the minor leagues. Uh, but uh, Mel Harder, just the ultimate gentleman. And uh, he would come around rarely, but when he did, it was always you know a, a very pleasant exchange. Uh, and, and you could tell, for all his success, he never... He, he, the little I knew him, he, he never let that become who he was. He was still Mel Harder. And, and I think you, you learn something from that, that they remain humble and true to themselves regardless of what the success or failures on the field. Yeah, those you know, seven degrees of separation. The fact that Mel Harder opened that ballpark you know, back in the 30s, I still think is wild. He threw the last pitch, but obviously you had the, uh, the arm issues. That um, When did that kind of start for you? Was it just kind of a buildup of, of pitching? It was. Um, you know, I, th- I think you know, after, and then having come back as the, as the director of player development here, you start to see a lot of research that's done. And going back, when you pitch over 200 innings in three consecutive years, the injury rate spikes. And I was right in that grouping. Um, I was coming off my third year of uh, 210 to 220 innings, and it wore out. <laughs> and, and the UCL let go, and uh, I had to have a couple of procedures to get it fixed. And unfortunately, I missed so much time, you know, because of the surgeries and the rehab. I never regained, much like unlike guys today, that you go through Tommy John surgery, guys are coming back throwing harder than they were. I went the other way. I lost velocity on mine. Was it, uh, you know, I don't know if I printed it out, but, um, yeah, when you, when, you know, you were let go, was that, you mentioned the business side, was that kind of a hard pill to swallow, the, the business side of baseball? As you're, you know, no one beats father time. and uh, It does, uh, and, and it was a tough pill because all I ever knew as a pro player was Cleveland. And maybe it was wishful thinking that that 
tenure, that span of time would continue on. But I think once once the reality hits, um, then it's on to the next thing and or the next team. And thankfully, at that point, you know, the Angels took a chance on me to rehab me and get me back, which never really panned out the way it was when I was here in Cleveland. But yeah, you you come to realize that. Uh, the game stops for no one. And for one reason or another, your time may end and the game keeps going. Was that something that benefited you down the line as a manager to have that understanding of, you know, your career could, you know, go belly up in a second? Oh, f- for sure. So the one thing that I tried to talk to, and this is teammates later on, late in my career, or even as a guy that was helping minor leaguers to get to the big leagues, is that you almost had to treat this as an inheritance whatever earning power you had, you can't live for today. You have to think about this is this is a point or a span of time in a grander picture that you've got to take care of it as best you can. Um, because like I said, the game doesn't stop for anyone. And when you were out for those couple seasons, did you follow the team at all? Did you see what was building in Cleveland with you know the Viergas and Alomars and the way they were, were going? Yeah, and, and those, you know, with the Joe Carter trade to San Diego, that was probably the the key moment for the rebirth of the Indians. When Alomar and Bayerga, Chris James came back uh, as as the three guys from from that trade, um, they became the cornerstones of that next or that championship run that they had. Then it was Kenny Lofton, and then when John Hart and Dan O'Dowd put together their formula with you know building around Charlie Nagy, uh, well, there was Dave Burba, other pitchers, then Dennis Martinez and Oral Hershiser. They were kind of the finishing touches on the team that won a pennant. But you could see that shift taking place, and, and they identified the right guys that were looking to get their first opportunity in the big leagues, and they hit on the trades that they made. Now, you did have the chance to come back for that, was it, I think, one game in 95. Um, yeah. How was that, you know, when you first walked into the clubhouse? And, I mean, it must have been night and day difference between the old ballpark and what at the time was, you know, probably cutting edge, 94, 95 baseball. Uh, it was like two different cities, two different organizations. Uh, this place was popping every night. You know, the consecutive streak of sellouts to the success on the field to the depth of the lineup that was there. I had pitched against this team with the Angels, so I, I knew that the lineup firsthand. But then coming back after spending some time in the minor leagues and getting a chance to come back at the end of the year and to see it from this side, yeah, it was like two different organizations from the one that I had played in previous. Do you still keep in contact with a lot of the guys you played with um, on Cleveland? I mean, did you develop some, obviously, Scott, you guys seem to be pretty tight. Yeah, Scotty, or, or when I was in Toronto, I would talk with Pat Tabler, who was, uh, you know, called games for the Blue Jays for a number of years. Um, I still keep in some contact uh, occasionally with Bud Black, uh, obviously Tito, um, but uh, that's probably the extent of it from there because everybody, you know, you, you life takes you in different directions. I guess, you know, John Farrell at this age versus John Farrell the rookie, would, if you could have five minutes with your old self, I mean, <laughs> is there any wisdom you'd impart or just enjoy the ride? or? Uh, um, big question. <laughs> it is a big question because, you know, between then and now is 35 years of, of life and, and happenings and events. Um, yeah, if I could go back and do my pitching career all over again, I probably understand quote-unquote pitching better now than I did then. I was probably more of a thrower then. I, I was fortunate that I had good velocity. I had stamina. And that's what I relied on. I wish there was maybe a little bit more of a complete pitcher that might have been able to prolong some success uh, than what was experienced. I didn't look it up, but do you recall pitching against Rotten and Ryan or Clemens or some of those guys of those eras and watching them? From- oh, yeah. I pitched against both of them. Um, matter of fact, there was one game in Cleveland one night, uh, or one Sunday afternoon, where we had a situation the night before that turned into a Oh, I think three times we cleared the benches the next day, and it was Clemens and I starting against one another, and it became a you know a little tit for tat. You hit our guy, I'm hitting your guy, and it was like I said, I think we cleared the benches three times, and uh, so yeah, there were some certainly some 
experiences and memories of going up against what are, in my mind, both Hall of Fame pitchers. Um, favorite or anyone, if you pick one player that you know bases were loaded with two outs, you didn't want to face during your career, what, what guy would that be? Uh, we'd be here all night talking <laughs> about that. There's a lot of them, um, but for me, the one guy that seemingly wore me out was a left-handed first baseman in Detroit and Dave Bergman. Um, for whatever reason, I threw a you know sinking fastball that kind of fit right into his swing, and he was tough on me. Uh, Walt Weiss was another guy in Oakland that wore me out. Uh, so there's a lot of names that I could say I wouldn't want to face, but for some reason, Dave Bergman was a guy that gave me fits. And that old ballpark, did you like pitching there? I mean, it was big, so I'd give you a little more breathing room, I'd imagine. No one ever hit one to deep center for a home run, so... No, I, Cleveland to me was a great place to pitch. Um, it was forgiving, you know, a symmetrical ballpark. So I likened it to Kansas City a lot. That you know there was no short porches either one in either left or right. So that was beneficial to a guy on the mound. Um, so I always looked forward to. You know, I know other teams didn't like coming into Cleveland because maybe the atmosphere. I looked at that as a true advantage to us. Do you remember John Adams and the bleacher and his drum? We How could you not? I mean, it's uh, it's great to see that he transitioned over to the new ballpark as well. And unfortunately, with his passing, um, that's a Cleveland icon, sports icon, that unfortunately is missed. Do you ever have players ask you about that? Like, what's with the guy drumming up there? You know? No, I think everybody just assumed that's part of the ballpark. He was a fixture, uh, much like some of the – you know, structure that was inside of both ballparks. And, you know, a tenure of baseball that you had from the 80s till, you know, recently, I mean, it's got to be pretty wild just to see the difference, whether it's the amount of information we're getting nowadays. You get every pitch on your computer instantaneous versus when you guys play. I don't know, he, you get a VHS to watch your old part you did video? <laughs> well, when I first came, there wasn't even video. So you had uh, a stat sheet in the clubhouse that you would kind of do your own game planning. So from where it was then to where it is now is light years. Um, some certainly for the better. Um, and I marvel at the guys that have remained in the game through that course of time because they've had to evolve and, and change along with it. So on the field, once strength and conditioning came full-fledged into the game of baseball, the speed of the game and the power in the game went through the roof. And that's not tied to PEDs. That's just different training methods that have just further developed the human body. So what you're saying, Aaron Judge would be hard to pitch against nowadays. He <laughs> would be hard to pitch against in any era. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, just that, that transition in baseball history, I think it's more dramatic in, in your time in baseball than I think any other time, just with you know, the amount of, of information and, and you know, all social media, just the way the game has changed. and. Uh, you know, would you would you have liked to pitch with this pitching clock, or is that something that you know, you're glad? You so, did? I think I think the pitch clock is a positive for the game, because when we were coming up, we were coming through the minor leagues and eventually the big leagues. The whole pitching notion was work quick, change speeds, and throw strikes. And then somewhere along the way, whether it was through the advent of power and speed, and game started to slow down because the pitcher on the mound was being a little bit more. Uh, deliberate, but the whole key, if you worked quick, you felt like you kept the hitter at a disadvantage on his heels. I think we're just getting back to that right now. Yeah, I mean, you look at those, those early games, part of baseball, two-hour games, you know, and actually 1920, a little different than uh, you know, the, the 80s, but um, uh, and you pitched with Necro, right? I came the year after Necro and Carlton both left. Okay. Um, yeah, because he was, uh, I mean, that guy... Still, you know, I, like it's amazing when we talk about you know just mechanics with some guys and like Feller never had a big arm issue. Negro seemed to plug along, but then some guys like you know if you could go back in time and see what Walter Johnson had in his arm or Feller yeah. or, or whatnot, but um, uh, that well, it wasn't going anywhere, I guess. But um, but yeah, I think that kind of any other you know reminiscence of your time in Cleveland or any thoughts about you know just your time in baseball. I mean, I just. It's very, very few people get that chance for even one inning in baseball, let alone you know a lifetime in baseball. So, um, yeah, I think the only thing looking back and just 
the experiences are vast, but along the way, it's the people that you meet and then get to know them even more when you're in a position to be a manager and, and there are coaches with you and you share um, the challenges, the successes. I mean, those are all wrapped, onto it, wrapped into it. One of the truest enjoyments I got when I was managing was when a young player would come up and make his debut. I always tried to find a way to take a few moments with that individual, that player, and and just maybe live vicariously through him as he's making his first appearance on the mound or in the batter's box, whatever. Because that's what a endless, seemingly endless number of hours of going into working out and, and picturing this moment in time happening at some point and trying to enjoy it with him. And real quick, I mean, managing in Fenway, was it ever like an eerie feeling just with the history and just, I mean, it had to, at times, just, you know, you close your eyes and that's 100 plus odd years. Of- yeah, it's it's got the feel of a cathedral, not a ballpark. Um, and maybe it's the closeness to the monster, to the green paint, to the history that's there, how close fans are to the field. It's a pressure cooker, but it's uh, it's really a unique place and a cool place to fortunately have worked. Awesome. Well, I don't want to keep you because you guys have your first pitch. Are you, oh, how many, yeah, yeah. How many first pitches have you done? This will be my first. Oh. <laughs> first time back on the mound since yeah. 1995. Oh, uh, uh, there you go. I'll keep these. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, I can if you want. You've been listening to Cleveland's Team, a baseball history podcast with Guardians team historian Jeremy Fedor.